all will see how great is our God. I want you to think about that this morning, though, and how shall they see? How shall they see how great is our God? How shall they see that? Think about that this morning. It's uh, definitely a pertinent subject. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we were talking about offense. We were talking about being offended, that as believers, it should be impossible for us to be offended. Have you arrived? Okay, good. We're all in the same boat then. But it's a, it is to be our ambition. In fact, I was watching a video this week, and uh, one of the people speaking on the video was Michael W. Smith, and you guys probably know his music. And he said he has two prayers that he prays every day. The first prayer is that he will never again in his life be offended. Second prayer is that he will be the conduit for God that God wants him to be. I thought, man, that is awesome. And then it really spoke to my heart since that's what we've been teaching on. I wanted to share that with you. But then we also talked about the fact that as believers, just being believers, if we're like Christ, people will be offended with who we are in Christ at times. Uh, just because of the fact that there's conviction uh, because of who we are as Christ. And the world hated the Lord for who he was. And he says, uh, we are not greater than our master. If they hated me, they'll also hate you. And so we know that, but do we take up offense in return if the world is offended, if my family is offended with who I am as a new believer, if I'm shunned, if I'm pushed away because of my faith, uh, do I take offense in return and return evil for evil or insult for insult? What do you think? No, right? But what does the Lord tell us to do instead? Give a blessing, right? Love them. Give a blessing instead. And so we've looked at that. Now we're going to look at a third layer of this offensiveness. And this is an offense that the Lord doesn't take up an offense. What he takes up is grief and hurt. And we're going to look at that today. It, and it just fits perfect. I was actually laughing as the Lord was unrolling this in front of us because it has everything to do with social media. And here we are moving forward in all this different social media stuff and the way that the Lord intertwines things sometimes is really just amazing. But I want to ask you this question. What does your cover page look like? What does your page look like? I know a whole bunch of you have Facebook pages, right? And, uh, you know, in, in our world of media, we build our own pages to look like what we want them to look like, right? And yet we have to ask ourselves, does our page accurately represent who we really are on the inside? Now this isn't new at all. This has been the condition of man since the fall in the garden. And uh, if you've ever read any of John Eldridge's stuff, he talks about uh, Adam and Eve falling and then they take up the fig leaf. They take up the fig leaf and cover themselves and they hide. And man has been hiding behind a facade ever since the fall. We all do that. And so John says, uh, are you hiding behind your fig leaf, your mask, that you put forward to the whole world? Or are you living out of the gen genuine, sincere truth of who you are in your heart. And you, you are an open book to the world. Which is it? I'll tell you, it's scary to be an open book. To be transparent. To not live behind the fig leaf. The persona. We all build these personas. And in our day and age, we see this especially on Facebook your page, how you put yourself forward 
to the world. But does the page match the person, really, on the inside? We have to ask ourselves that. Turn with me to Matthew 23. Matthew 23, starting in verse 23. Matthew 23, 23. Should be an easy one to remember. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cl uh, clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup of the di and of the dish, so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to those Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Does the Lord sound offended with who they are? Well, it never says that God's offended. I did a study all week on that. It, God is never said to be offended, but he is grieved and hurt. He takes up uh, even a judgment or a wrath against those who have grieved him in, uh, in their offense. <laughs> it doesn't say, though, that he has taken up uh, offense but the thing is, is God is the, about the only one that would have the right to be. Because he sees the heart. He sees the inside of the cup. He sees what's on the inside, where the world only sees what's on the outside. God is the only righteous judge, right? There's only one who is able to judge what's on the inside. I may think I know what's going through your heart or mind, but as I've learned through marriage, even if you're with somebody day in and day out you may not get it right am I telling the truth there I mean it's difficult right we think we know and yet how many times are we surprised at what's really on the inside what's really going through the heart and mind of a person Jesus knows the Holy Spirit of God knows God knows what's on the inside and so when a person is operating with a facade of righteousness or spirituality and yet on the inside the Lord sees uh, that it is contrary to that. Hypocrisy is this. It says the assuming of a false appearance of virtue or religion. God's not impressed. When we polish ourselves up to look the part of that Christian man or woman that we would like to look like, God's not impressed. The Lord's looking on the inside, and so there's a great teaching here. It, you know, one of the definitions for hypocrisy was feigning to be on the outside what we are not. And so, as I thought about this, I thought, this is amazing. Look at what's going on in our culture today. You can make yourself look like anything on Facebook. You can make yourself out to be anything you want. Create yourself in, you know, any way that you want. Make a page that looks like anything. Post anything. But what's on the inside? What's going on? 
on the inside. That's what the Lord is concerned with. See, there's a great danger when the Lord says, Woe, woe, woe to these that are doing this. He's warning them, woe to you, and he says it three times. And yet, he's, he's pointing out a couple other indicators. Number one, they strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. This goes right back to a fence. They are people who have taken a fence. They're taking their water glass, and, uh, oh, there's a gnat in there. I better make sure I get that out. I don't want to drink that, right? And yet, at you know, they're, they're worried about the gnat in their water glass. This is where this proverb comes from, by the way, looking into it. It's the gnat in your water glass that you're straining out. And yet they drink bitterness, gall, malice. I mean, all of the greater sins, uh, they drink down a glass full. And yet they strain at the minor things. Uh, one of the, the really insightful commentaries from Barnes said this, says, you Jews take great pains to avoid offense in very small matters, uh, superstitiously observing the smallest points of the law, like a man carefully straining out a gnat in a glass from which he drinks, while you are at no uh, pain to avoid great sins, hypocrisy, deceit, oppression, and lust, like a man who should swallow a camel. I thought, man, we can do that, can't we? Get offended in a little thing. And that's kind of what we were talking about in offense. We can focus on the little things that bother us and then become bitter. Right? You didn't wave at me. Right? And, and then, but here's the thing. If we stumble over the fact that somebody didn't wave at us and then we believe the worst, you know that's malice to believe the worst about somebody. And then, if you take up malice and then become bitter over it, you see what I mean? You focused on the gnat and you just drank the camel. And so the Lord is saying, hey, don't do that. These people who are operating in hypocrisy are doing that. And so this really ties in with how do we gain victory over offense? Don't strain at the gnats. Because if you strain at the gnat, you'll swallow the camel. Make sense? We have to be able to let the little things go. Operate in grace and love, which we've been talking about. And have that character on our inside. Who are we on the inside? If I'm not full of the grace of God, how can I give it out? If I'm not full of love, how can I give it out? If I'm not full of the Spirit, one of the... the uh, uh, fruits of the Spirit is patience, right? People say, don't pray for patience. That's an absolutely foolish statement. The fruit of the Spirit is patience. What I need is the Spirit of God working in me. And that's no big deal. Now some people would say, I, can't, I cannot drink a gnat, okay? I get that, I understand that. The Lord is saying, forget about the little things. Let them slide on by. Don't worry about them. Don't strain at those things to the point that it breaks down the important things, which are relationships. I can tell you this is one of the greatest frustrations that I see in my marriage and as I counsel others. We strain so easily at little things and then end up really hurt, right? We've taken on offense. We've taken on hurt, bitterness, malice, Things that will really, really hurt us. There's another principle here that the Lord has pointed us to. And, and this is how we are cleansed. You see, sometimes we think, well, I just need to quit doing that. I'm going to make a New Year's resolution. I am going to quit doing that. How successful is that for you guys? It's not very successful for me. It's not the way that I see the Lord working. And the Lord doesn't tell us to, hey, you know, clean that up over here. Do that. He, what he's saying is clean the inside of the cup. And there's an amazing miracle that happens if we clean the inside of the cup. What does he say happens in verse 26? 
first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may be clean also. See, if you clean the inside of the cup, voila, it's done. The outside of the cup is clean. We don't have to worry about the outside. Worry about the inside. If you clean the inside, the outside of the cup takes care of itself. It's just the way it works. It's a wonderful thing. You see, learning to look better is how you clean the outside. Asking God to make you better is how you clean the inside. Falling on our knees and being able to say, Lord, I am so miserable at this. I strain at a gnat all the time, every day. Forgive me, because I'm sinning every time I take offense. Help me, Lord. I don't want to do this anymore. Forgive me. Forgive me. Give me your spirit in greater abundance that I can walk in your spirit, not in the flesh. Make me new on the inside. And you know what? When we do that, we gain victory, don't we? That's where the victory is. Jesus having his way on the inside. The outside stuff just fades away. It's gone. It's washed away. It's wonderful. So, many, so much of the time it seems like if we just try harder at Christianity, cleaning up the outside, making those, those vows, those New Year's resolutions, I'm, I'm going to just work at that. I'm not... Well, you know what? We need Jesus. We need the Spirit of God to do a work and then say, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I want your work done. I am, am submitting myself to your work. I want God's power to do the work, though, because I can't clean myself up. I need Jesus to clean me up. Does it make sense? You see, pretending to be something on the outside that we are not on the inside is dangerous. Because, honestly, folks, one of the new counseling areas that pastors are being pushed into is the self-deception of false images that people create and believe of their own. I know this sounds way out there, but listen to me. People are being self-deceived to create an image of who they are on Facebook to the point that they believe that that image that they've made is who they are and yet there's no way to live it out in real life. The only way they can live it out is behind a screen in their bedroom. They can't be that person in real life. And it scares them to death that they're going to run into the people that they're interfacing with and, and making this persona this fig leaf online that they can't be out in reality scares them to death. So they just keep hiding behind the screen. Huge. It's a social disassociative disorder. They can't deal with the real people that they even are friends with on Facebook. They can't deal with them face to face. Because they can't be the same person face to face that they are online. Here, are you following me here? The social damage is there. And it isn't a new sin. It isn't a new problem. Facebook isn't anything. It's the, it's the same old facade putting up appearances and not being who we say we are on the inside. We must be the real deal on the inside. If we are to be God's people. Now think about this. Now this is where we're going to get to the real rub for the Lord. It's one thing. A sinner is a sinner is a sinner, right? And sinners do what sinners do, right? But we who are called the Lord's, His sons and daughters, are we to operate as the world does? Still be in bondage to the same sin that has held us captive in bondage? operate in the same ways, we are not to be those people. God's people are to be the genuine article. And how shall they know we serve a great God? How shall they see the Lord and see that He is mighty? They need to see us filled with Him, unable to strain at a gnat. 
that his grace and his goodness are evident in us, that they see him in us, the reality of it. Not just a cover, not just a page, but the real thing. See, the Lord, when he sees people doing this that are broken, they don't know the Lord, they don't have him in them, but when he sees his people do this, he is greatly, greatly grieved. In uh, Psalm 78, welcome to turn with me there. Psalm 78 gives us a look at this. In the nation of Israel has seen God move in great power. They have seen every kind of miracle. Uh, they have been the beneficiaries of the miracles. I mean, God has just poured out his power, his miracles, and yet, what do they do? They turn from him, right? They're out in the wilderness, they complain, they, don't, they have no faith. I mean, they're living in the miracle of God with his miraculous provision, and yet would we be any different? I doubt it, really. Here's the thing, though. It grieved God. In uh, 78.40 through 42. Now there's several places in this uh, psalm that, that really get this point across, but it says, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert, and again and again they tempted God and pained the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the adversary. See, the Lord has done a great work in us, right? Jesus came that he might uh, destroy the works of the devil, correct? Jesus came that the, the hold that sin and death had over our lives would be broken. The miracle of salvation has happened in our life, right? But how it pains the Lord when we go back into old ways and the facade old way now listen folks I don't know how you live behind the fig leaf but when I was an unbeliever it was a serious matter when I look at this in Psalm 78 I had seen God do great works in my life my family's life and yet I turned away from him I turned away from him. I turned away from his power, the, the knowledge of his power. And I, I know that I hurt the Lord when I did that. I forgot how mighty a God we serve. And yet, as Kit shared this morning, I felt like that guy in the pig pen that thought my... The servants in my father's house are better off than me. I'll just go and be a servant in his house, and that'll be great. But the cool thing about that, that parable is that the father was standing and watching and waiting and hoping for the son to come home. Isn't that great news? The Lord loves us, and if you read through this psalm, I would urge you to do it. It's a great picture of this. The Lord held back his wrath from just totally wiping Israel away. From just destroying them for forgetting him, forgetting his power, and then they're going back into old ways, and yet what do they do? They claim supremacy. We are the people of God. I mean, they have this facade of greatness, and yet on the inside, they're not. They do not have even the faith to see and believe in the great works that God is doing. The Lord does not want his people to operate in a facade. He does not want that for us. He wants us to be genuine ambassadors for him in this world. That people would see him through us. That they would see the work of God in us and be attracted to that. That souls would be added to the kingdom. That his kingdom would be advanced. He needs real, genuine believers. Not people who can post things on Facebook 
and make it look good, sound good, but on the inside have nothing.